lights on because I was freezing yesterday. But... Or not. Same thing. It's 11.10 and time to resume. Welcome to panel number three. This panel is going to focus on Braille production, but before we get to that, there's a couple of housekeeping items that I need to go over with you. One is there are now tactile maps of the Grosbeck Center at the registration desk. So if you'd like a tactile map, and then somebody who gets one can explain it to me, because I have not been able to figure it out. <laughs> there seem to be doors where there are not doors on this map. Or maybe I'm just walking through walls. Who knows? Um, also, Stephen Rothstein, could you come up, please? Stephen's going to tell us more about the picnic this evening. Yep, I'm here. There. That's cool. Um, so I think... Uh, I think all of you got emails, but just to confirm, we're offering a picnic tonight, um, that, so right after, around 5.30, um, behind where I am, kind of in front of where you are, there's a pond, and there's a gazebo there, so from kind of 5.30 to 7, hamburgs, hot dogs, chickens, veggie burgers, but I know a lot of folks also have other plans, so just to be sure of the right amount of food, if you're planning to come, if you could raise your hand, there's no cost, but I just want to get a sense so we don't have... We don't run out of food. So just hold them up for a second while I... Uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. Okay, great. All right, so fantastic. So if you have your hand up, you're welcome. If you come and your hand isn't up, we might run out of food. Um, so if you change your mind, let me know by lunch so we can order. And again, it'll be 5.30, quarter, 6. Um, you can ask anyone where the gazebo by the pond is and Hamburg's hot dog veggie burgers. And I've been asked to make this room warmer. And um, so I don't have any control, but I went to the woman who does, and it's getting warmer. And uh, so we, we bumped it up a few degrees. You should feel it the next little bit. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, this, sec- this panel is on Braille production. And if you are noticing that the order of panelists is not the same as the order in your program, it's not because we are just doing this randomly to suit ourselves, but each of these panels has discussed among themselves and decided the order in which they would like to present. So this is the panel's choice order. That being said, I will introduce the first panelist. As with all the panels, each person on the panel is is going to represent a somewhat different point of view, different approach to the topic. And our first panelist will be John Bryant. John is... John John sounds like he Surprise. didn't Surprise John this is what we decided <laughs> John is the head of the NLS production control section and they're the folks who produce all this stuff so John's been there for quite some time John Thank you, and good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I read once that the human brain is a remarkable biological phenomenon. That is, the first cells begin at conception and continue to grow and establish connections from birth throughout the, a person's life until they stand up to speak in public. <laughs> so, <laughs> Knowing that, I hope uh, you'll, you'll be forgiving. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, NLS uh, book and magazine Braille production. Uh, we at one time had a, uh, a, a, we were working on a mission statement, that sort of thing, and we realized that our mission statement is actually very simple. It was given to us by law. Uh, the, the job of NLS is actually to provide a free library service to U.S. Uh, citizens who are not able to read print. It's, it's basically that. 
uh, for, for one reason or another. And therefore, we, uh, we use a number of different ways to do that, but that is our mission. And I say library service because that's one of the issues I think that we're going to talk about. What is a library service? So in, into fil fulfilling that mission, however, what I'm going to talk about are limitations or or um, you know the, the uh, limitations that uh, we face in accomplishing that. And whenever you're talking about limitations, you can also look at that as opportunities. Opportun whenever you have some sort of a limitation or a barrier to what you can do, you're confined in what you can actually do with what you have, it also offers an opportunity to perhaps move that limit or, or remove that barrier. And that's hopefully what we're going to be talking about today. So I'd, I'd like to start by just giving you the list of the limitations or the, or the, the uh, box that we work in. The first limitation, of course, is funding. It's dollars. It's the money that we get from Congress every year in order to produce the Braille books and magazines. That budget, fortunately, has been very steady uh, uh, from Congress over the years. They have not taken money from us as they have from other agencies. Of course, we got hit by this sequestration, but we are uh, not, uh, it's not affecting the Braille uh, as much as uh, the audio side. So we are basically working with a flat budget. That's the good news in that we are able to uh, uh, continue to produce with the funding that's available. The bad news is that uh, there's probably, in the present environment, not more coming. That is, it's, it's not real likely that Congress is going to decide to give us a lot more money. I don't know. I have no inside scoop on this, but I would not count on that happening in 2014. So therefore, we work within that limitation. Now, what are the other limitations that we have? Well, the selection. It, you, the group just spoke to you about the selection of books. And, and our uh, selection librarians do work within that limit. We tell them, we'll, we can only buy this many books this year, so you'll have to choose from all the books that are available in the US, you'll have to choose just this number of titles, basically. and uh, and. In addition to that, uh, the staff has been asked not to choose books that require, um, uh, that are more expensive to produce. And for that reason, over the years, we have chosen very few books with tactile graphics. Tactile graphics added a great deal of cost to production of NLS books, and therefore, there was almost a conscious effort not to choose books if they required tactile graphics. Uh, com complex books in general are very uh, much more expensive to produce for the, for the uh, contractor who has to do them and, of course, uh, when we have to pay for them. We actually have a category in Braille of books called abstruse, and only a bunch of librarians could come up with abstruse <laughs> to mean difficult books. But they, we do have a category, a bid category, and we say, well, if we give you a regular book, how much will it cost? And then if we give you an abstruse book, how much will it cost? And it's more uh, because of the difficulty in producing the Braille of that type of book. So that's a limitation, too. The librarians can't choose too many abstruse books during the year. Another limitation that we have is the number of people who read Braille. The, that is that uh, the, uh, in order to produce Braille, there has to be a need. And that number seems to have declined as far as what we're required to produce. Uh, just just uh, over, over the past years, I can tell you that about 10 years ago, we did about 605 titles, and uh, we produced about uh, 60 copies. About five years ago, it was down to 502 cop, uh, titles, and uh, we produced 55 copies. The last year, we did, we've contracted for uh, 467 titles and 40 copies. Now, there are a number of reasons for that. One certainly has been the economy that uh, over the past uh, few years, where a number of network libraries that were ordering copies from us decline, they're, they're no longer ordering those copies. That's certainly one one reason for the reduction. But there's also the uh, the Braille readers readership has not demanded that we produce more copies of books, and these are hard copies I'm talking about right now. But that that has not 
caused a, uh, an increase. And, and we've been talking here about the ability to produce more, and uh, we haven't had the demand that would uh, justify that if we were doing it. Um, another limitation that we have is technology. Uh, the Duxbury transcribe uh, software came, along, came on just about when I started at NLS, and that was a wonderful thing. Uh, to, to be able to transcribe Braille uh, with a computer what offered the opportunity to continue to produce Braille uh, at a cost that was not significantly increasing with, uh, with the cost of, uh, uh, with the cost of living in general. That is, uh, the technology was helping us in the transcription. Most technology advances that we see today are, have to do more with distribution of information than they do with the transcription. That is, that uh, the, the web, the World Wide Web, and the uh, and, you know the uh, the Bard, uh, the ability for of people to download and all that sort of thing, has to do with people getting the books that are produced rather than the actual production of the master file that that is that book. So that that technology, since it it feeds the world other than the Braille world, is very helpful to us. The web has been a great uh, benefit in our ability to dis to distribute Braille. Um, we're able to distribute now on the web, and and uh, before long we are hoping that people will be able to get uh, uh, Braille in other ways without having to have a hard copy. So the, that technology helps. However, there there are not uh, we don't have a refreshable Braille display. We don't have some things that we do need to have, and as as uh, I'm sure many of you are aware, the the patrons we serve. Many of the patrons we serve are not web enabled. They are they are not on computers. It's a small percentage of of the people who actually use the web, and we have to provide library service to everyone. So it's a limitation that we work with in that we can't say, oh, we're on the web now. We don't have to do anything else. Mm -hmm. It's not something we can do, at least not yet. Hopefully that will be true years from now, but it's not yet there. The next thing is capacity, and this is the, <laughs> the most discouraging in a way, and that is that uh, the way we actually do this, we put a solicitation up on the, uh, on the web and uh, uh, ask people to give us their bids for doing books the way we require that they be done. We have very uh, stringent specifications that say this is how a book has to be done. And we do receive from uh, the, the usual bidders come in, uh, who we know and they know us and, they, and we know they can do the books and sometimes we get someone new. Quite often that new bidder, they, they will submit samples that do not pass. They simply are not able to produce to the quality standards that we require. And that limitation sometimes means that we are able to actually produce fewer books just because we don't have enough people to produce them. Even if we had the money, we can't do them. And that's a very uh, uh, irritating limitation from my point of view. If we if we get any if I get one cent from Congress, then we want to do books with it. That's really what it comes down to. So that's where technology can help. Technology. Uh, I've, I've heard discussions about how technology will help that that uh, to do to uh, happen, but it hasn't happened yet. All right. The uh, the. Other, I, I've, ha I've heard suggested, and, and, I, and I'm not disagreeing with this, but it's been suggested that if we changed those standards, that is, if the, the requirements for the quality were not so great, that that will help. And that's quite possible that that will make a difference. And certainly with some, some uh, formats, some types of books, we can change those requirements. Whether it will be enough to really allow us to do all the things that we would like to do with Braille, I'm not sure, but it may help. It's not going to be the answer. Uh, we have taken great pride over the years in the quality of the books that w our contractors have produced for us. We, we've held to a very high quality standard, and we hope that those books stand up. But uh, uh, as Peter was talking about the difference between fast food and a great restaurant, it's true. If, uh, if you think of it in a way, we need to take advantage of the technology to be able to offer perhaps more content with uh, less stringent rules. 
So that may help. It's a limitation, but uh, I hope everyone's talking about that in your groups. So those are the limitations that we have. Uh, and uh, I guess in conclusion, I'd say we hope to leave this summit with, if not solutions, the seeds of change that will result in us being able to provide more Braille content, more books, and in, to more people than we're able to do right now. That's what our goal would be. It's going to be a library service. We can't, as with any library, not even the Library of Congress has all the books. Uh, we can only provide some books. We're not going to be able to provide everything. But for the ones that we can provide, we'd like to do more, and we'd like to, do, uh, to offer it to more people and to have that more accessible to them in, a, in an easier fashion. That's our goal, and I hope uh, when we finish this, you'll be able to tell us how to do it. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you, John. Not only does NLS produce Braille, but our regional libraries, the network of libraries that actually circulate the material, many of them produce Braille as well. Our next panelist, Beth Hurst, is from the Iowa Regional Library. And those of you who are fans of web Braille may be aware that Iowa has produced several hundred titles that we currently have in WebRail. They also do a lot more material that uh, textbooks and things that aren't so suitable for WebRail. Beth is the supervisor of library materials production at the Iowa Library for the Blind in Des Moines. Beth? Thank you, Judy. Good morning, all. Um, my colleagues on this panel all represent national programs of one sort or another, and I'd like to bring you a more local perspective uh, as a regional uh, library and to let you know what sorts of things we do and how we do it. Uh, as a staff, we are small but mighty in the, production, the Braille production area. We have a, a Braille coordinator who is a certified Brailleist, a Braille transcriber who is also certified, and a Braille production clerk uh, who is a Braille user herself. And the coordinator receives requests, edits and prepares assignments, um, trains and gives guidance to volunteer Brailleists, uh, assigns the work, and also does a considerable amount of Braille herself, especially math and foreign language. Uh, she mentors students in the Braille uh, transcription course and um, provides quick turnaround items uh, as they are requested. The, uh, the second person, the Braille transcriber, does a lot of the same things, but also does some Duxbury translation. Um, she oversees the proofreader core and the data entry volunteers and handles invoices from Braille contractors that we use. The production clerk receives all the completed assignments from the volunteers and contractors, embosses, bursts, binds, and all of that uh, physical work. Uh, she ships completed projects to the requesters or passes them on to um, the associate in the instructional materials area. She produces Braille labels, and also because she's a very techie sort of person, she provides technical assistance for BARD users and uh, anything regarding assistive devices and applications. In terms of scope of projects that we do, we do just about everything. Uh, our first priority is employment materials for uh, people's jobs. Um, next is uh, pre-K to 12 textbooks, and that's the vast majority of the work that we do is um, uh, textbook and classroom materials. Um, especially teacher-created worksheets. We do thousands of worksheets. Uh, we do tactiles of every kind, especially math and maps. Uh, patron requests. We're very patron-driven. Nearly everything that we do is, uh, arises out of a request from a student or a patron. Um, we do some items for the collection that are uh, just general interest uh, when we have time. 
and then other ephemeral kinds of things like restaurant menus, theater programs, bank statements, and a wide variety of other items. Uh, we work with a group of about 40 volunteer Brailleists uh, throughout the state of Iowa and across the country. Uh, we have started in the last five or six years using more individual contractors. So um, these are folks who have set up um, their own private business of uh, uh, brailing, and then we will pay them for their work. Um, and we are well aware of the high costs of uh, braille production. Uh, we work with a prison program at Anamosa uh, and also uh, send assignments uh, initiating Braille to other uh, prison programs nationally, uh, national providers, and, and other commercial groups. Um, our library was established in 1960, but um, people in Iowa have been Brailling from long before that. There was a very active Temple Sisterhood uh, group in Des Moines, and one of our most famous or noted volunteers was a woman named Elizabeth Porowski who started brailing in the 1930s and continued to braille up until a few weeks before her 97th birthday um, uh, when she passed away. So um, we have very loyal and active uh, volunteers, many of them who have been with us for 40 or more years. Um, I don't have any um, figures that go back before 1996 because that's when our online uh, tracking system uh, came up. But I do have some production figures for the time since that. Since then, uh, as near as I can tell, uh, due to some vagaries in that uh, production system, uh, over those 17 years, we have produced in the neighborhood of 18,425 items. Um, the average per year is about uh, a little over a thousand, but the the number has been ramping up. So fewer in the first part of that, and and more than a thousand since then. In the most recent year of uh, June of 2012 through the end of May this year, um, I counted uh, 1,300 items that we had produced um, for the school year. Actually, it would cover two school years this, this past year. Uh, the number of items we did for uh, instructional materials was uh, about 1,023. And the items that we produced in-house by uh, our two uh, certified transcribers is uh, 288 in the last year. The equipment we use, um, we have two Braillo 200s, a Romeo Pro 50 that produces jumbo Braille, uh, a Romeo attache, attache and Thomas embossers for labels, a forms cutter for bursting, electronic hole punch and comb binder, a Tiger Pro embosser for tactile graphics, uh, an inkjet printer and tactile image enhancer, a thermoformer, and a variety of six-key entry-capable keyboards. Uh, we would uh, love to have a uh, Braille 400, which is a high-speed unit, but they are um, uh, beyond our, our capacity at this time. Uh, the main thing I really wanted to touch on is how there have been a number of changes in our, really our paradigm for <coughs> collection management uh, in the last several years. Uh, we've talked a lot about the differences in hard copy and digital Braille and Braille on demand and those sorts of things. And this is really the direction we're going. We have prided ourselves in Iowa for a long time as having the largest Braille collection in the United States or even the world. But that is no longer the case. The main reason is the storage space. We have had in the past uh, off-site storage, kind of a warehousing for the older titles that don't circulate much, and the state has decided to um, tear down the building where we had our Braille stored. So we've had to do a lot of weeding recently. And so the, the mindset has had to change from we will keep any Braille book just because it's Braille and save the Braille for the Braille's sake alone. And instead of that, we have to 
decide what needs to be kept and what can be kept. When we go through those old uh, titles, some that haven't circulated in 25 years, you open the book, the pages crack, the pages disintegrate in your hands. They're no good to anybody anyway. So um, a lot of things that are um, unusable and uh, out of date, you know, medical information from the 1950s, uh, this sort of thing we have just been throwing away. It's, it horrifies people that we have thrown away thousands of volumes of Braille, but uh, uh, they really aren't useful in any, any fashion. In, in place of that, we are keeping all of our files that have been produced since we started using computer Braille, um, uh, we keep those digital files. And if a patron wants a book that we created in the mid-1990s, we can run off a copy for them. We don't have to keep a copy on the shelf. If we do make copies, they will, as Diane described, um, they will go out, and we will take them back um, uh, as a return and, and shelve those items, but for the most part, we aren't making hard copies to put on the shelf before anybody asks for them. I met with my team uh, before I came here to ask them some questions about um, how they they see our braille production area and uh, how they would um, describe what we're doing right and what they would recommend to other places that might be interested in, in doing braille production. I, I said, what are we doing right? And they said, we have a great team and great equipment. We're open to change. We're adaptable adaptable and flexible. We're now proofreading everything. Now this is, goes against what uh, Pete suggested yesterday, but we have found that uh, uh, our quality has improved, and especially with our textbook materials, we try to proofread everything that we do. Um, we've been able to increase the number of requests we can fill by using contractors, and improved organization and tracking has streamlined our processes. Now, what would we recommend to an agency that wanted to start braille production? The first thing they said was a climate-controlled embossing room that would humidify and dehumidify as the seasons change. <laughs> I gather that humidity is a major problem when you're dealing with braille paper. Uh, the, after that, they need a first-rate production tracking system so we know who has what and when and when it's due and when we get stuff back. Uh, ongoing training for volunteers and others on new rules and formatting and everything that they need to do. Um, what are the minimum requirements? They said a computer with Duxbury or Braille 2000, which is the primary um, application that we use, and one embosser. That's, you could, if you've got that, you can start a Braille production program. An ideal setup would include everything that we have, plus, um, as I said, a high-speed embosser, uh, a more current tiger embosser for the graphics, and more staff and more funding. <laughs> uh, we foresee some changes uh, coming down the pike. Well, there are always changes. Um, one thing that's good is the uh, expanding use of access technology. I think they would echo everything that's been said about uh, refreshable Braille displays and uh, decreased cost of that and... and um, all of the things that we've been discussing about technology. Um, one thing that they are uh, leery of is the coming change to unified English Braille. Uh, this is going to have a, a large effect on both our, our transcribers and our proofreaders, uh, who are mostly patrons, and um, making those changes is, is going to be an, um, a painful process, I'm afraid. Um, there are things that they've suggested uh, regarding what needs to happen to promote Braille. And um, my production clerk, who, uh, as I said, is a Braille reader, she gets on her soapbox. And um, she has suggested a number of things. But the one thing she said that I think is really a, a good idea, if we could ever push it through, she says, start in preschool and teach all children Braille just like they're now teaching sign language or foreign languages to the very tiniest children and continue it with children that are interested, whether they're blind or not. 
in a generation or so, we would have trained people who could go into the field of uh, teaching Braille and being uh, teachers of the visually impaired. Uh, I could see that, that happening, and it's not that hard to learn, especially when you're young. So that's what I have to say about the uh, Iowa Department for the Blind's Braille Production Area, and thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Our next panelist is from an organization that you might not necessarily think of first when you think of Braille. Um, Betsy Bowman is, well, the agenda says Betsy Bowman, Vice President and General Manager, Benetech Palo Alto, California. Doesn't say anything about Bookshare.org, but we all know Bookshare, and uh, Betsy's going to tell us about Bookshare and Braille. Thank you. And I am going to talk about Bookshare and Braille, and I'm also going to talk about a couple other really important things like our diagram project, uh, which is why we get this whole Benetech and all these different uh, phrases going on in here. I guess since I did talk to somebody last night who has never heard of Bookshare until yesterday, I want to just do a quick uh, little meter here. So applaud if you, until maybe today or yesterday, have never heard of Bookshare. I know there are a couple. Yeah. But let's do a different one. How many of you are Bookshare users? Okay. You know, a, a portion of the room, not, not everyone for sure. Um, okay, but let's jump right in. Uh, and this is, I love being on the production panel because I'm kind of a geek, and this gives me license to geek out. Um, so uh, join me on the, on the geek trail. So um, to talk a bit about Bookshare, and I'll talk about uh, our Braille books and how we get there and, and what we're doing with them. I'll talk about Diagram and our work on accessible graphics and then a little bit about something we call Born Accessible, which I think is critical to the future. But um, I always like to start with thinking about users. Um, in addition to those of you in the room, um, we just got this in from a teacher, I think yesterday, um, saying... Thanks for this service. Can't thank you enough. Today's Braille students have access to so many books in Braille that were not available to my students years ago. You're contributing to their literacy, there's that word that Karen used yesterday, and their quality of life. And I mean, that's all of our goal, right? Everybody in this room is involved at some level in doing just that. Um, so let's talk about uh, how we try to do that. Um, a, little, a few quick stats, if, if you haven't heard lately, just some of where Bookshare is today. Today we have about 197,800-ish books. Um, we're adding them at the rate now of about 3,000 per month. Um, so it is about 100 a day, and I'm a little obsessive. I, we put a book counter on the front page of Bookshare, and I just sort of like click reload really often on the web page just, just to watch it go up. It's, it's kind of fun. Um, Occasionally, it goes down because of you know quality change outs or publisher things, and we'll talk about publishers a bit more. We have a little over a quarter million users today in 40 countries. Uh, most of those are U.S. students, as Michael Uden referenced yesterday. Um, and Karen asked me a question uh, a while ago that I'm not positive I ever got back to her in email, so I'm doing it here, which is she said, how many... BRF downloads do you have? And in 2012, we had about 222,000 BRF downloads. Um, that's about 18%. These are book downloads, this not counting our periodicals that we get through NFB Newsline, uh, which are fabulous. Um, but that's about 18%. Now, that undercounts the people that use Bookshare books in Braille, of course, because there are people who download the Daisy books and use those on different Braille displays and people who transcribe from those. But that just gives you an idea. And I will say we have um, a – that's a pretty good proportion because, because we do so much work in the schools and we serve people with all print disabilities, we do have a pretty high percentage of users who are not Braille users, who are you know, dyslexic students uh, of all ages. So pretty good clip of people still using Braille uh, actively, which I'm happy to say. So, you know, let's not get into the postmortems yet, guys. You know, 220,000 is a lot. <laughs> um, how do we do it? So uh, one question that came up a little earlier today, I think from Judy, was, so if, if I'm 
if, if I'm fixing some errors in a Bookshare book, can I get those back to you? The Braille errors. So the way that we do our production is that we get books in from multiple sources. We still do lots of scanning. And, and I've got to do, I know there's at least one here. I've got to do another applause thing. How many people have ever been or are today a Bookshare volunteer? All right. <laughs> We adore you. Uh, this is how Bookshare started, and you can thank Paul Edwards for you know a gazillion sci-fi books. I know that to be the case, um, but <laughs> he's, he's counting back there. So, so we do still get lots and lots of books into Bookshare from volunteers, from volunteers who scan and proofread the books. We also have other uh, volunteers who are now doing image descriptions, which we'll talk about a bit more. Um, that's one source of books. Another source of books are the books that we scan in-house, and we take student requests. So for qualified students that use Bookshare, any student that requests a book from us, we will add, period. Um, it's really hard for all the reasons everybody has just talked about from a budgetary standpoint, because for those books that we have to scan, that's expensive, because every single one of our scan books is proofread, which is a bit different from the early days. Um, but you can't serve students without proofreading. Now, they are proofread um, prior to going through processing, and that's important because we don't do a Braille proofreading of every single book. We do spot proofreading on the Braille side. Um, but we do also have a way to report book quality for every book, and that's whether you are reading it in Braille, whether you are listening to it in TTS, or whether you're using it in enlarged font. Uh, and we want those inputs. Um, another aspect of getting books in, and the reason when I say 100 books a day, is because we have over 200 publishers who give us their books directly. And, and somebody mentioned this earlier as, wouldn't it be nice if? And it is nice. Um, we sign up a publisher, and once they go through our digital quality checks to make sure that their formatting doesn't have weird things in it and that it is able to be you know, uh, changed into DAISY in a good format, then they start flowing in. So... Uh, literally, we are getting books the same day from the same digital distributors that Amazon, Apple, everybody else gets them, which means that we just can crank them in. I will say we had a bunch of folks who were not so pleased when they look at our What's Been Lately added, and we were getting all the Harlequin books in, and we had some people say, okay, enough with the romance. We've seen, you know, can we get something else in the pipeline now? Um, but I just saw we yeah, got a whole other chunk of Harlequin books yesterday. So if you like Harlequin books, we have somewhere around 8,500 or 9,000 now. So enjoy. <laughs> um, uh, so, so they come in, we store them in DAISY, and then they are pumped out into multiple formats, uh, and that includes BRF. And so when somebody comes in and says, I want a BRF file, and I want it to you know, match these specifications that are in my user profile, then it is chunked into BRF on the fly. We are doing some additional work uh, over the next few months. We, we have a list always based on quality reports and our own testing of what needs to get fixed, because... They ain't perfect, and we know it. And, you know, as, as Pete Osborne said yesterday, I, I don't know that they're ever going to be perfect. This, anything that we do electronically is not going to match what a transcriber can do. Um, at the same time, we've got to get better. So we keep working on the technology to say, how do we kind of approach better and better and better so fast can also be high quality? Uh, and with that, we have also done our first test of UEB. So we will be producing Unified English Braille, and I was uh, smiling listening to Frances Mary in a talk uh, about a month or so ago and saying, you know, she's going through differences and saying ellipses, and I'm like, yep, we saw that problem. Yeah, so uh, we, are, we are doing our first test, but they are not ready for prime time. So those of you who I've asked to do some testing for us, uh, hang, hang on to your hats. Our, our QA team hasn't let them get out the door yet. Um, so that's a little bit about Braille uh, and, and what we're producing. And, and again, every one of those 197,000 blah, blah, blah books are downloadable in BRF and usable in electronic Braille. We don't do any hard copy, in case anybody's confused. We do work with transcribers who do. Uh, but let's talk a little about graphics. Uh, images and graphics are a huge issue, as we've all talked about, and we all know they're expensive. There's a lot of decisions to be made about which ones you produce, and so we've looked at some, some big questions. 
How do we address gaps? How can we look at technology, again, to not do everything, but to do more and more and more so that the experts can do the real expert stuff? Um, you know, we're looking at tactile graphics as part of a larger ecosystem of accessibility. So uh, text and audio description, tactile graphics with descriptions, sonification, so you can hear things going on electronically, smart images that will either talk to you or have haptic feedback, so by touch. Um, so there's some really interesting things coming that uh, we're working with some very smart people on. And that's key for us. How do we leverage the crowd? So whether it's APH who are working with us or National Braille Press or NFB or, or many other groups who uh, we want the smart people, which you know include a lot of people in this room, please, 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 let's all work together to make this all possible. Um, we have a tactile graphics working group and a number of subcontracts that deal with, with tactile graphics. And this is all around sort of research and development, not production per se, but we're, we're kind of getting into now producing samples. So we're looking at questions like, when is a tactile required? There are some images that just don't, don't flow for a tactile. Um, how can we make them easier to produce, right? They're pretty expensive. How can we help make them cheaper? How can we make them easier to use? And how can changing technology like haptics and sonification start to be an answer or part of the answer? So... Um, I'm going to jump ahead and say one of the projects that's been going on with Lucia Hasty, who some of you know, and Josh Mealy at Smith Kettlewell and Steve Landau of Touch Graphics and a woman named Ting Su, who fabulous young TVI uh, uh, from UC Berkeley, uh, is working on a decision tree based on the BANA guidelines and trying to automate that. So how do you decide which graphics are just not important at all, which ones need to be described, and which ones need, you know, really, really, you need to have a tactile representation. And then how can we, you know, automate some of these decisions so, again, the experts can focus where the experts need to focus on making good tactiles. Um, we're looking at how do you make them easier to produce? So how do we move this process upstream? If you're ebooks and we're trying to do everything electronically, how can we make sure that these electronic files have the right uh, attributes to then be able to be a good tactile graphic, whether they come out of a tactile printer or a 3D printer, or you know you use them in some whiz bangy way on a screen. Um, National Braille Press did some great work in this area evaluating SVG software. So you know, how do you get things into an SVG format so they can be tactilely printed? Um, and also look, they looked at the promise of 3D printing. This has come up a bunch. We think this can be huge. Why? Because this is a huge commercial trend. And the more people that use the stuff we want to use, the cheaper it gets. So uh, there's another project we're about to start uh, with this same group looking at 3D printers around schools in the United States and trying to see how they can be used for, you know, not only uh, actual potentially raised Braille that, that Pete talked about, but actually different sorts of tactile representations, whether they're raised 2D or real 3D. And it would take too long right now in this whole room, but I have a little, if, if none of you have ever played with anything from a 3D printer, I have a little nut and bolt thing that's just a, a cute example. Um, how do you share tactiles, right? So these things are expensive. So it'd be great if we didn't have to reproduce the same stuff over and over and over. We're looking at ways to share image descriptions and kind of, there's a lot of legal questions about this, as you might understand, and we're talking about that. But you know, we, if somebody describes a heart once, you know, why describe that same diagram 10 more times? That's, that's a waste of resource. So we're looking at ways to share, including... Now we're going to geek out metadata. So we have an accessibility metadata project going on that actually can go below the book level into the, the images. Um, that is funded by the Gates Foundation and something in conjunction with a whole education push in the U.S., but it's an international approach. Uh, so we're hoping that this leads to the ability to say, hey, here is an accessible graphic this is something that maybe an expert has worked on to make sure this will be a good SVG tactile. Let's make sure you can find it when you need it, whether you're a teacher or a student or somebody who's, you know, looking at cool designs of lampshades, whatever. Um, we have a diagram content model. This is a way to say what, what, images what, what stuff do you say about an image, including is there a tactile and let's have a tour of the tactile. 
Um, Poet is a tool to help you describe images faster and easier. You can also uh, textually type in math and it will turn it into MathML. Um, so there's a bunch of little tools and things. These are all at diagramcenter.org. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff on that site. And finally, let's talk just briefly about some of the new tech. So uh, I mentioned a little bit about haptics. Uh, Mark Hakkinen at ETS is doing some really interesting stuff coming up, looking at how you can actually do assessment items and have haptic feedback, meaning uh, think about Android phones do this really well. They buzz. So how do you get that picture to buzz under your finger in a way that it means something, right? It isn't just a buzzy thing making your finger tingle. Um, we're also looking at you know, 3D production downstream. How, 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 do we, how do we improve what could be done with different sorts of 3D, 3D printing work? And finally, SAS Institute uh, is, is looking at examples. They'll do a smart atlas. And I understand National Braille Press does a lot of work with them on their, their atlases now. But let's look at maps, clearly something that, that benefits from, from being tactile. How can we have sort of these smart images that will buzz under your fingers and give you sound that you can drill into on an iPad or an Android tablet or some other device? So these are some of the kind of the new new kinds of things we're looking at. And, and finally, the last area besides Bookshare and Diagram I said I would mention is born accessible. To us, even though I run Bookshare, I know that even at 3,000 new books a month, Bookshare cannot keep up. We can't keep adding accessibility after the fact. We're going to have to add some of it because there are just going to be things the commercial guys will never do but we believe that publishers have to be publishing accessible books, at least at a base level. So we are on it. So a lot of this work we're doing is out actually talking to some of those same publisher partners that give us their books today and say, hey, guys, guess what? You can now create a more accessible ebook. And uh, because uh, our diagram partner, George Kirscher and Daisy, as well as NCAM up the street, um, you know, we have actually tools and standards and things we can share with them. So we're not just beating them over the head. We're saying, let us help you. And I think that's, that's really key. So, again, we believe that everything that's now being born digital should be born accessible. No more excuses. And please join us in getting that done. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Betsy. Wow, that is some really exciting stuff going on. All right. Our final speaker this morning. I know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Will give us yet another perspective on the topic of production of Braille. Tuck Tinsley, president of the American Printing House for the Blind, comes from what is probably the largest Braille production house in the world, Tuck, I would think. I I would think so. And so Tuck is going to tell us about how it's done on the big scale. All right. Thank you, Judy. Uh, APH is truly pleased to be part of this summit, and it's one that, that we feel that we will see real actions and results. So on behalf of all the, the Braille producers, uh, I'd like to salute NLS and, and Perkins for hosting this summit. I'd like to start by providing just a bit of background information on Braille that probably should be part of the record of this summit. Uh, APH was founded in 1858 to produce tactile materials and textbooks and books. First embossed books at APH were printed in Boston line letter. These were small raised letters. In the late 1860s, Overbrook School for the Blind in Philadelphia started embossing books with capital letters, and that was the Philadelphia line letter. So APH then combined Philadelphia line and Boston line upper and lowercase levels, and in, in 1872 embossed books in a new line letter. <clears throat> now there are three line formats. APH produced all of them based upon what people needed. In 1879, an act was passed by Congress 
establishing APH as the official source of educational materials for school-age blind children in the United States. Five libraries added sections of embossed books for the blind prior to 1900. Boston, as Karen men mentioned, was the first in 1868. Then Philadelphia, Chicago, New York City, and Detroit. However, at the turn of the 19th, at turn of the century, very, very few books, other than textbooks, were available to the blind. And those which were, were in five separate embossed systems. From the mid-teens through the 1920s, APH also embossed materials in American Braille, New York Point, and revised Bra Braille grade one and a half. Those are the iterations of dotted things mentioned by Karen yesterday in her opening remarks. All of these systems would gradually be replaced by standard English Braille, adopted as the uniform Braille system for all English-speaking countries in 1932, thank goodness. <laughs> now to NLS. In 1930, American Printing House for the Blind, AFB, and the Braille Institute in Los Angeles testified in support of bills to provide books for the blind on a national scale. Then the Pratt-Smoot Act became law in 1931, and $100,000 was appropriated, establishing NLS. And 15 titles were selected the first year, and they were placed with producers submitting proposals. APH, the Braille Institute, which was really the Universal Braille Press in L.A. then, and the Clovernook Home for Blind Children, or for the Blind in Cincinnati. As Karen said, NLS is the major provider of Braille to the public. Many organizations represented in this room have supported NLS from its first day in existence. And I know all of us are committed to working together to do whatever it takes to provide quality Braille at a reasonable price in a timely manner. APH produces approximately 18 million pages of Braille a year using Braille O's and, and other electronic printers. And, and yes, zinc plates uh, with 100 plus year old clamshell presses. That, as Peter said, um, you know, should be a production process seen in museums. However, um, when you have Braille or a tactile graphic on a zinc plate, in Boston zinc plate, you know you're going to get the same results with every pressing. You won't have any drop dots. And when you include 80-pound paper at 50% humidity and let that clamshell do its work, it doesn't get any better than that. So what does APH produce? To give perspective, APH produced over 100 new products each of the last years, five years, over 100 new products. Those numbers don't include Braille items. This year's new products include things like Tactile Town, an orientation mobility product. Visio Book, APH's first portable video magnifier produced by Baum in Germany. Bookport DT, Braille Plus. As a percentage of sales, 10% of sales are for Braille. 18 for electronic products, 22% for large type, and 50% for educational aids. The provision of tactile materials, though, is why APH was founded. We did produce 18 million pages of Braille last year. We also made thousands of tactile graphic masters. Copies of these were produced using pressings from plates on thermography machines that used a heating process or thermoform from graphics. Press masters, masters from the Roland printer, and even collages. We produced thousands of covers. Color covers with actual copies of the original covers, NLS covers, and special order covers. And thousands of bindings. We produced five types of bindings. And in ascending order of cost, stitch bindings, plastic spiral bindings, Plastic fingers bindings made with equipment we brought from, bought from Braille International. Metal rings and flexi spiral binding with color covers, which is the binding system we developed for our, our textbooks. 
In addition, we produced 1,100 different tests and test-related materials, and of those, 90% were produced in Braille. So how did we do it? On staff, we have 15 literary transcribers, literary certified transcribers, three NIMA certified transcribers, eight textbook formats certified people, four graphic artists, ten proofreaders, zero music transcribers. That's it. And that is insufficient to do all we do. So we outsource. Jennifer, where there's Jennifer. Jennifer Dunham provided me total certifications through May of this year. In the nationwide, we have 1,343 literary transcribers, 114 Nimeth transcribers, 41 music transcribers. Now, for APH, with our needs in textbooks, we need transcribers who know textbook formats. NBA has 144 people nationwide certified in textbook formats. No, uh, linear Braille doesn't fill the bill for early, early Braille users. And we can use people in prison programs. There are 36 prison programs in 27 states. 788 transcribers, 582 male and 206 female. And the female are better. Uh, so, so we used about 400 of these outside people as transcribers last year. There are many transcribers calling many of our ex officio trustees looking for work, especially literary certified. These people aren't volunteers like the, the ones Beth mentioned. They're career employees deserving a fair wage. Maybe a system could be developed where they could contract directly with NLS and an organization could, could filter them or do some work. Braille International in Stuart, Florida, went bankrupt a year or so ago. And the current producers for NLS, APH, National Braille Press, Associated Services, and Clovernook, we're able sometimes to come close to breaking even, but usually we must underwrite the NLS Braille Book Program. This year, APH took... We figured what we were bidding on, and we took $362,000 from endowment to underwrite the NLS book program for the books we're producing. And that's an issue we all can address. We realize we're better off now than we've ever been. We have access to information like never before, but we have a ways to go to have access equal to the sighted population. By far, by far, the biggest challenge in Braille is the provision of tactile graphics to represent charts, graphs, drawings, and pictures in textbooks. Department of Education staff were at APH last week, and they talked about a new term they said we'll be hearing, and it's called gamification of educational materials. <laughs> As you know, textbooks are becoming extremely visual to be more interesting than video games or whatever, and that makes the job of the transcriber much, much harder. With the time and cost it takes to produce STEM textbooks, science, technology, engineering, and, and math, we don't begin production until we receive an order. Of course, subsequent orders take much less time to produce. Literary titles are a breeze, but not those literary titles with graphics. Currently, we have six math textbooks ordered awaiting transcribers. I want to give you examples of a couple of books, STEM books that we, we're currently transcribing. So these numbers I'll give you are estimates, but they're, they're pretty good. Selling price is probably right, right on. But pre-calculus book, 1,098 pages, 6,500 Braille pages, 1,500 graphics, 58 volumes. Our cost will be $35,000. Our selling price will be $1,400. We underwrite the expensive part, the initial transcription. Chemistry book, it has 738 pages, we know. 
Estimated Braille, 3,500, 400 graphics, 25 volumes. It'll cost us 18,800, 18,800, and we'll sell it for $718. So, what's the solution? You know, APH's dream, Lou, is to have a, uh, a, an iPad that has a skin. And that skin would be maybe polymer or whatever, but it would raise to Braille. And a full-page Braille, you would have tactile graphics that would have solid lines and intersecting lines and dotted lines, whatever the transcriber has, has placed in the file. In closing, uh, I want to direct you to a table of some of the things I've talked about that will be out on the right. Stephen set it up where the bagels were this morning. <laughs> Uh, and Jack will be out there, but and then we'll have we'll, it'll be there through tomorrow. But but there you will have uh, examples. You'll have a, a graphic of Massachusetts, and then thermoform copies of that graphic of Massachusetts. That graphic of Massachusetts I have is from the Roland machine, which is a machine that we can produce five of these at one time. It can run all night. Um, it's plasticky. This this title. This, this uh, Massachusetts is from an, a book that was mentioned earlier, Ed, which is, where's Ed? Ed, which was uh, How Shapes Got Their, shape, How States Got Their Shapes. Got their shapes. <laughs> well. And it's, it's not, it's one that we, we can use to draw, pull states from. We haven't transcribed it. 49 to go. But, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so I'm going to present this one. You can have this one, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Also, we have uh, metal plates with, with uh, zinc plates with uh, Massachusetts and then, then press pages. We have various uh, thermography graphics, uh, four samples of bindings, three products, a Braille Plus 18, a refresher Braille 18, and a TI-84 calculator, and then bro brochures for those. And they'll be out there to the right today and tomorrow. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Wow, these guys have, again, raised some very, very interesting issues. We do have time for questions, so who would like to go first? Done silence. <laughs> We're all just overwhelmed. Terry. Tech's going to be our microphone runner. <laughs> okay, I'm uh, Terry Gorman, and uh, Betsy, I'm... Uh, uh, Bookshare volunteer, one of your trusted volunteers who does uh, scanning and proofing. I just did my 29th book. Woo! Um, and we spell check them, by the way, before we submit them. Thank you. Um, one, uh, one of the things that excited me so much about Bookshare when I discovered it was that I love going in bookstores and browsing. Um, I know that some people like to only uh, you know, learn about a book and then go someplace and, and look it up and see if it's available, but I'm someone who has this sort of encyclopedic interest. I want to know what's out there. So uh, what I would do is I would go through the Bookshare listings of all the books added to Bookshare, and I would, I would literally read through them. And there's a couple of things um, that I'm wondering about. Um, uh, you, there's no categorization of the books except uh, the books that volunteers actually uh, scan and submit. So if I submit a book, you know, I can select the category, but if you get a book from a publisher, you don't have a categorization of it in the list of categories that you have posted. And I'm wondering if you could, you know, if you, if you think that there's enough people out there who would like to see the books in categories, um, and would you be interested in using someone like me who's a retired guy who, you know, has my whole life... Uh, available to me would be interested in doing something like that. Uh, actually, I went through the music books. I, I, I searched through your entire collection and categorized the music books, for example. Um, and um, let me think there was one other point. Well, I mean, uh, and then for someone like me who doesn't want to know the Harlequin books, um, <laughs> can I do a, a browse which would say, please don't show me the Harlequin books. Uh, to, it, it takes a long time to browse through every book that you have submitted, but I've been doing it except for the last two months I stopped doing it. 
Well, it's, it's good that you stopped the last two months, like I said, because there's just been tons more Harlequins coming in. Um, so categories. We, we do get back to this word metadata from publishers. So when we get our publisher books in, uh, it's something called Onyx. Uh, We have been looking to how to normalize, if you will, the different kinds of categorization that different people want and need. So I'd say stay tuned for a little more of that. Um, There isn't a way right now to say everything except Harlequin that I know of, but there is a way to, you know, to basically look, and you can go into our advanced search and look at sort of not romance category, for example, if, if it's not just that publisher, but that whole genre. So, and, and do, do we want more people to volunteer to help on cool projects like that? Oh, uh, wait. Yes, we would love to talk to you more. So, so let's connect. Paul? Great, thank you. Okay. Paul, Paul Edwards. Uh, this is a question for Tuck. Tuck, I don't. Uh, running out of the room there. Come on. Now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good decision, Tuck. I don't. I, I don't understand um, your 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 cost breakdown um, in in terms of uh, say your chemistry book or your math book. So maybe you could provide just a little bit more information of how you subsidize and whether you subsidize for every project and uh, because it, it's not all clear to me how that works. We, uh, we do subsidize the initial transcription of the titles, and, uh, and then finance does the costing from there. So uh, we set a, a little margin on the, if we were to, to produce a thousand or something, we might make a little money. Otherwise, you know, we just, we have the underwriting that just disappears. That's our mission, though, I mean, to provide the materials. I'm not going to give you a breakdown of all the finances because I don't know them. Thank you, Paul. Cool. <laughs> you can be Anybody involved. else? There's one over there, Mark, from France, from AVH in France. Speak English, please. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know Tuck is not very good at French. <laughs> All right, just one question. Um, is the, the issue of disposable Braille still on the agenda or not? That's probably a good topic for your breakout sessions, which will be after lunch. Uh, I did ask one time for Pete Osborne yeah. to tell us about solid. How many of y'all remember solid dot braille? Yes, me too. <laughs> um, back yeah. in the, what do you think it was? Six, yeah, I, did. I remember scratching off the dots. When we were kids, we liked to scratch off the dots and make dirty <laughs> words. You know? <laughs> but I do, I think it was in the 60s and 70s, there was the, the Scottish Braille Press did solid dot braille, and they, it was on paper that felt like newspaper. And they had these dots that were little plastic dots that were applied. And the coolest thing is you could pick them off, and it was like they were never there. Pete, <laughs> Pete, what, can, you, Pete can you tell us about solid dot braille and whatever happened and why it happened? And- uh, I can a little. Yeah, you, you could actually pick the dots off so cleanly. You could uh, make um, quite rude sentences in hymn books and things like that. <laughs> Do you remember that? Steve, Steve's, Steve Tyler's sitting next to me. We, we had a, a school uh, hymn book, and you used to approach a copy of it with some trepidation because you, you would never dare sing what was actually in the book. <coughs> it's really quite scary. Um, two, two, I mean, it, it, it actually was quite, quite an expensive um, process, but the, the more fundamental problem um, actually was the material that was used for the for the solid dot. Um, ultimately, with all the various health and safety regulations that come in, um, they found. I, I don't think I don't think they quite said it was carcinogenic, but they got quite close. Um, so you know, can, could could you receive cancer from reading a braille book or something? Was possibly one of the concerns. But in in general, the material that was used at that time was was deemed not to be. Uh, um, safe and, and useful, and it's one of the things that affected. For example, um, some people might remember um, uh, Moon magazines, uh, raised Lion Moon magazines, that were also produced, and the similar issue affected affected them. Um, so it was uh, the, the resin that was used at the time was was not deemed to be safe. 
Um, but I have seen an example recently um, of of a raised uh, a, a solid dot um, uh, production, which I think um, used something along the sort of three D reprographics um, line to, to to produce the, the the braille, and it was pretty successful. And one of the things, obviously, you can do with things like that is create really high profile dots because you're not actually creating a um, uh, a, um, a, a cone in, in paper, a, um, a, a hollow dot in the paper, you can actually build up quite substantial um, solid dots on, on the page. So you can actually vary the, the, the quality of the Braille on, on the page. So there are some experiments in, in that area that are underway at the moment. Maybe uppercase letters could just be taller. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any more questions? No? I think we're good. All right. Uh, part of this conference is lunch. Lunch is provided to everyone who's attending the conference. It will be over in the Howe Building in Dwight Hall, where the reception was last night. Now, an important point. The conference resumes at 1.30 with the next breakout session. So you will need to go directly to your breakout session and not reassemble back in this room unless you are in breakout session one. So find out what your number is, and at 1.30, please be prompt because you know how hard it is to get the whole process done in that time. Oh, Mary, Mary Nell's here to talk about... Hang on, guys. Hold on. We're not, we have not recessed yet. Mary Nell's here to talk about breakout session three. Thanks, Judy. Uh, breakout session three is really going to be quite different in terms of what we're asking you to think through. Um, the other two this morning and yesterday really were much more practical. Closer to the uh, mic. And, pardon? Closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. Sorry. It's seldom I'm told to speak up. Um, <laughs> What we want you to do is be part of a go wild brainstorming this <laughs> afternoon. So you're going to have freewheeling, uh, unlimited t ideas uh, to produce input to NLS on, and to the field on identify ways through which NLS can produce Braille that is more flexible, affordable, and practical. So it'll be uh, at 1.30 back in uh, the third group that you were on, have on your name tag. Group number one meets in here. Uh, group two will be the student center, which is if you go to the coffee counter and turn right. Uh, the group three, the large conference room, is up on second floor. And room four, the flex room, uh, is right across from this one. So at the back of this room, if you go out those doors, flex is right out there. So your uh, focus question is, how can NLS produce Braille that is more flexible, affordable, and practical? And the quote for this one is a Mark Twain. I think it's quite um, appropriate for this particular breakout. A person with a new idea is a crank until the idea succeeds. <laughs> so with that thought, enjoy your lunch, and uh, we'll see you at 1.30. All right. Everything okay? Everything's fine. Good. All right. I don't know why I can't have 49 more states. I love 49 to go. I went through the categories, and it was very difficult.